I went looking online for pictures of joy, and uh, I found some pictures of joy. Pictures like this, and the next one, uh, people dancing for joy, uh, singing with joy. People tend to look up a lot for joy. My favorite is, is the picture I found of Snoopy. Uh, <laughs> This is good, but uh, go to the next one. That's my favorite. When I think of joy, this is what I'm thinking of. You know what you never see amongst all the joy, dancing for joy, singing for joy? You know what you never see? You never see slouching for joy. So uh, it, it, was, it struck me, I was kind of slouching over the computer and looking into this. So uh, I never found slouching for joy. We're going to be singing joy and, and praying joy and preaching joy today. And, and so uh, I, I want us to be able to practice joy. And so I'm going to ask everyone, if you're slouching, just kind of lean back. Get your shoulders back. Come on. We are not going to slouch for joy today. I know, Trudy, it's hard. I ask so much of you. that. Uh, but this is, we're going to look at joy today. Because Paul gives this church an amazing compliment. This church at Thessalonica, he says, You, you are my glory and my joy. You're it. You are my glory and joy. It makes me wonder, what is your glory and joy? If you think, what is the thing that brings you most joy, what is it today? It changes over time, right? If you think about what gave, brought you joy when you were young, when, when you're young, what brings you the most glory and joy? It's your own accomplishments, right? Your own musical prowess or academic achievement or, or uh, amazing skills on the field. Well, that might be true for y'all. It really never was for me. But musical achievement, right? It's what we do that brings us glory and joy. But as we grow up, as we, we follow Paul, I mean, Paul is a learned, educated fellow. He could take glory in himself. But what brings him joy, and what brings joy to those of us who, as we grow up and mature, is taking joy in others, right? If you think of the moments that have brought you the most joy over the last years, are they all about yourself? If I think of the moments uh, that have brought me the most joy, last week I told you about Ricky, this uh, teen who came to, to camp, church camp, and risked uh, losing his spot on the team or his, having to be on the bench. And one of the reasons I remember him so fondly is uh, with such great joy is I remember talking with him. And, and we somehow got to talking about politics and faith and the way that your faith impacts the way you vote. And I've been thinking that for years, right? I, I'm 34 at this point. I've been thinking about politics and faith for a long time. But I remember watching him as we were chatting about this, and I realized he was making connections about this for the first time. I was standing right there with Ricky when he figured out that what he believed is going to impact how he voted. And that was just a gorgeous moment to watch a young man have that realization. That was joy for me. When I stand here and preside over a wedding, <laughs> whose day is that? It's not my day, right? Well, when I'm presiding over a wedding, it's their day. I just happen to be in front of them. And yet, as I watch that couple, at some point in the, the service, and it changes depending upon the couple, at some point, as they look at each other, they realize... Wow, we're made! And there's that, there's that moment of joy, right? That is one of the most powerful moments for me to be right there when it happens. It's not, all, it's not at all about me. I'm just a cog. I could, they could have called any pastor to do that, but I got to stand right in front of them and watch them as it happened. And it is so very cool. Right? But the joy I have, the glory I experience, is not ever really about me anymore. It's when y'all pass the peace. And I see someone pass the peace, and I know that was a powerful moment. Or when someone makes an offering of something to the church, and I look at that offering and say, wow, that, whew. Or, or the moments when family, yesterday I stood with a family that, around a gravestone, and they, they, they told stories of a loved one. And I, these are the moments that bring me joy, to be able to be there with others as they have these powerful moments. And, and, and it makes me wonder, do you have joy in others? Right? Is your glory, is your joy in, in others, or, or is it in yourself? As a practical matter, it's not just a, a matter of maturing in faith and, and growing in our faith. I think it also becomes a very practical thing, because uh, if all of my joy is only in myself, you know how many of there, there are of me? One. Right? There's a lot more of you. If I learn to take joy and rejoice in you, I'm going to have a lot more joyous and joyful of a life. And so that's what we see Paul start out with. You are my glory. You are my joy. All of you. You're just such a blessing to me. He, he says this to them, but he's worried. 
He's worried, and he, he's worried about this church, worried about how, the, how they're doing. And so he, he, he sends Timothy to go check in on them, right? He, say, he says, I sent, I'm sending Timothy to encourage you, check in on you, but he, he's going to encourage you. And, and you want to know how that conversation went when, when Paul looks at Timothy and says, I need you to go to encourage the church at Thessalonica. You know what Timothy's response was? Hey, hey Paul, did you notice that was 360 miles ago? You want me to walk for three weeks just to show up and encourage some people? How about we send him a note, right? That, I'm sure that, that's what my response would be. Timothy's still learning, so Paul has to tell him, Yeah, I know. Three weeks. Start walking. Tell me how it goes. Right? That, that's the importance of encouragement. That's how important it is to encourage each other as the church. That it, Paul is willing to send Timothy to walk for three weeks to show up to encourage people. And I think we, we need to, that is how important encouragement is for us. I was reading about, a, a, a leadership article I came across this week, and, and they had a statistic, and you know how statistics are, everyone can make them up. But this was a statistic that seemed to hit on something, that um, for every negative, critical thing I hear, for every time that someone is down on Andy, and I know that, it takes about five good things to hear before I can kind of get over it. That, that it's a, about a one to five ratio because you know what happens you hear something critical you hear something bad and it, what does it do it sort of gets stuck in your head starts ringing in your ears and all you can think about for a while is how that person is down on you and, and there's a problem here and, and, and it, it, it takes other people encouraging you reminding you I love you man I'm here for you you're doing good work it takes quite a bit of that for us to be able to get over uh, when things go sideways, when things go wrong. And so it is, I think, critically important that, that we do as Timothy do, does, not so much that we take 360 mile hikes, but that we are sent to each other to encourage each other. And, and this does not have to be anything uh, above and beyond, anything crazy or abnormal, but just, I miss you. I'm so glad you're here. You're doing good work. And to encourage each other, because I, I believe it's true that there's always someone in the church that needs to be encouraged. It, it changes. Some of us are always having good weeks. Some of us are having down weeks. But there's always someone in the church who needs to be encouraged. You know, I, I'll confess that uh, once upon a time, I, I viewed encouraging and complimenting people as, as something I, to do rarely because um, I wanted it to really matter when I did. I wanted people to pay attention to that. And uh, I'll tell you what that made me. A jerk. It may be a jerk because then I would, when I would compliment people, it would be the exception. And, and Oh, Andy's a jerk. Why is he saying that? That's very out of character for him. I'm glad I got over that. I, I, there, I don't think it's possible to be too encouraging, of, 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 to truly be encouraging of others. Not like having to gush at each other all the time, but the sense that we are constantly encouraging each other uh, because it's just so important for us to do as a church. Now, the risk of what happens if encouragement doesn't happen, Paul tells us that too. He says, I sent Timothy to encourage you because I was afraid. I was afraid that our labor would be in vain. It's a legitimate concern, right, that this young church, people gathering in the name of Jesus, that they might flounder and fall, that uh, they might backslide away. Uh, that, that's the, the Methodist term for this. We call this backsliding, and, and we've seen it happen. People who are excited and on fire, and they're, every time the church is open, they're there, and they're showing up, and they, they want to get involved, and then a year later, you look around and say, where'd so-and-so go? What just happened? And that's backsliding. That is Paul's concern here that this church, this young church will have backslid specifically because they're taking some heat for their faith. And he tells them, you're going to take some heat. Don't backslide. Just, just buckle down and keep on going. It's going to be fine. And so Timothy takes this hike to encourage them, and he shows up, and he tells them they're doing good work, that they're following Jesus, and he is able to go back and tell Paul they're nailing it. Right? They're doing good work. He comes back and he tells Paul, and Paul is ecstatic and he is overjoyed. And this is the ending of this chunk of the letter, this sort of narrative history Paul gives us. And he ends by just being so excited for them, being happy for them, being joyous for them, being glad that this whole church thing, this whole following Jesus thing is working out. It is changing their life. They are strong in their faith that his labor has not been in vain. And Paul's looking forward to filling in some gaps in their faith, and he'll proceed to do that in the coming chapters. But he, he ends with this marvelous benediction, his, this prayer for them, giving thanks. 
Now, the most interesting thing about the fact that Paul gives joy for them, has this such great joy for them and with them and excitement and encouragement for them, is that Paul has all of this joy when things aren't perfect. Did, did you notice that, that thing, what said in the reading? There are parts lacking in your faith. And does Paul stop to obsess about the problems in the church? Does he start out by saying, here's what's wrong, here's what's messed up, here's what you need to work on? No, he starts out by having joy at what is good. Even if it's not perfect, even if it's not right, even if it's not his expectations, he is taking joy, he is rejoicing in what is good. And he'll deal with the gaps in a bit. But I think what Paul, what Paul is getting at here is this other aspect of joy. First, we take joy in others, and we take joy in what is good even if it's not perfect. You know how usually I tell you I'm preaching for me, and you happen to be in the room, what's, what happens next really is for me, because this is something my family struggles with, taking joy at what's good even if it's not perfect. And I'll tell you where it shows up. It shows up when we cook. Yesterday, I, uh, Olivia was down selling some uh, baby clothes, and by some I mean lots of baby clothes at a garage sale. And uh, we still had plenty left, if you go talk to her if you need anything. Uh, and so I'm up here with Sophia, and we're going to spend some uh, Father uh, Sophia time. We're going to hang out this morning, and so I'm going to make her something tasty for breakfast. And so I get out some grits, and I cook up those grits and some chicken broth, and I shred some Parmesan cheese, some really good Parmesan cheese, and I blend in some cheddar, cheddar to make it really uh, cheesy, and then a little bit of cracked black pepper, and I take some bacon, and I, I dice it up, and I throw it right in the skillet so it, it cooks up like bacon bits, and, and, and I, take that all, I take all the bacon and the grease, it was so good, and I pour that directly into the grits, and then I top it off with a little bit of some salt that's the smoked salt so there's a little bit of smokiness to it toss some of that in and, and and I sit down and I serve myself a big old pile of this delicious mm, and a little Sophia sized pile too and we sit down and I start to say something to Sophia and I start to do this thing that my family does we sit down and as soon as we sit down with a meal we start critiquing it we start tearing it down. We start thinking, you know what, if I had made, I needed to start the bacon sooner. so that, And I should have made it not just chicken broth. I should have used half chicken broth and half. I'm going through all these things I could have done better in my mind. I'm, gonna start, I'm, I'm looking over at Sophia and I'm about to do it. I'm about to tell Sophia all the things wrong with these grits. And, she, and I realize she doesn't care. She frankly just does not care. You know what she's doing? She is horfling. She is putting that fork in those grits and she is eating those. She eats like me. She is shoveling those grits in as fast as her little hands can move. She is loving those grits. And I'm, I'm thinking about Paul, right? Because i got to write this sermon. And I think about Paul and he is taking joy in the good. He's not obsessing that it's not perfect. He's not looking at this church and saying, you know what? you got some problems. He's saying, y'all doing good, and I want to be excited for that. And I look down at my grits, and those grits were good. I'm going to have them for lunch. They're going to be good. They're not perfect. I'll do them different next time, but they're good. How often does our sense of perfect get in the way of our ability to enjoy good? Right? How often do you find a situation that's just perfect? How often does something just completely match your expectations? And how often do you walk in a room and you think it should go a certain way and because it doesn't go exactly that way you kind of get off kilter and you just kind of obsess about it? Or that one thing is wrong and you focus on that instead of the rest of everything that's good in front of you? You ever do that or is that just me? Right? <laughs> Look at Paul. Paul is taking joy in others and he's taking joy in what's good. There's some problems, he'll get to that later. But he Paul would just sit down and eat the grits. I'm sure he would. One last confession before we, we wrap this up. I sit down to read this chapter, and uh, I read through this chapter of the Bible, and I read it, and I read it again, and I read it again, and I thought, I'm doomed. There's nothing here. This is really boring. Blah. You ever read a chapter of the Bible and you think that? Right? It happens, right? I, I read through this chapter of the Bible three, four times thinking, I'm going to have to stand up on Sunday and they're going to look at me and they're going to expect something impressive and I'm going to go. It was boring. And then I remembered, why am I preaching this? I'm preaching this, this book of the Bible because my friend Brian Baker showed me how he can read Paul and how he can pay attention to Paul and what amazing finds he can find in Paul. And so I, I got out my notes that Brian had given me and I noticed 
what he, he, he told me what he would preach on each chapter about. And I looked at what he would preach about and I thought, yeah, that is interesting. And so I went and looked at that phrase and then I read, read another phrase and I just kind of paid close attention to what, what exactly is Paul writing. And you know what, friends? I probably should have preached two or three sermons on this. This was fun. Because Paul tells us a couple things. Every, these three things, are each one could probably be a sermon, but this is, these are the three things Paul leaves with us with this week. First, practice rejoicing in others. You don't have to find joy in your own life always, because sometimes your own life is hard. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's hard, but we can practice finding joy in others. Rejoice in, in, in what's happening in others' lives. Second, encourage someone. Don't hike 360 miles to do it. Hike across the street. Hike across the pew. Hike across the church. Make a phone call. Pick someone and encourage them today. Can you do that? Who can you encourage today? Right? Do you think of someone yet? Who can you encourage and thank today? And then tomorrow do it again. And third, Paul reminds us not to let our sense of right, our sense of perfection, our sense of what should be to get in the way don't allow that to get in the way of enjoying what's good right in front of us. Eat the grits even if they're not exactly how you would have cooked them. Right? That's my prayer for you this week. Go out and eat some grits. They might not be perfect, but they're going to be tasty. Amen. Who here likes grits? Man, y'all need to go to the south. Don't stay there. Come back, but... <laughs> yeah. Oh no. Like bacon and parmesan and cheddar. They're very tasty like that. We are now going to pray and, and, and confess to God when we have not enjoyed grits. Please join me as we pray together.